Hello and welcome to episode 25 of the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. As I have done a few times in the past, I will be diverting from the canned intro for a few announcements. The first is a shout out to Ricardo and the Greater Austin Aquarium Society. This club is relatively new, having been founded eight months ago, but is going strong. If you're even remotely in the Greater Austin area, you need to join this great club. Also, check out their Facebook group page, which is simply Greater Austin Aquarium Society. Now, regarding this week's interview with Shelby Bush from Seagrass Farms, this will be the first time that I've actually had a follow-up call to include additional content into the episode. The second part of our conversation begins right after the first concludes. You are for sure going to want to check it out as Shelby talks about another conservation effort headed up by Seagrist and also an in-depth look at six oddball species available at Seagrist Farms right now. So, on to the interview. Today's date is Wednesday, August 1st, 2018. My guest today is Shelby Bush. Shelby is the brand ambassador for Seagrass Farms. Shelby's a lifelong aquarist and spent over a decade working at one of Michigan's largest pet stores on the freshwater team and eventually as a buyer for eight years. She's given numerous presentations and talks on a variety of subjects and can be found at most pet trade shows representing Seagrass Farms. So Shelby, welcome to the Aquarist Podcast. Yeah, it's great to be here. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of the day, and you know, I know that we're actually uh, in the in the beginning of the evening, or actually later in the evening for you over on the East Coast. So, thank you very much for uh, staying up so late and jumping on the phone with a complete stranger. Um, so, Shelby, if you wouldn't mind diving into what is your origin story? How did you get started in the tropical fish hobby? Well, my origin story was, you know, my family had fish, so I had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it was a beautiful thing growing up. You know, my parents had aquariums, um, and that's how one of the persons why they met was it started with aquariums. My dad with a couple of goldfish. Um, so I was born into it. Our, our family used to sit around the table, and we'd talk about the aquarium uh, and about the biology and the different behaviors of the animals. Uh, and then we'd actually open our books before the Internet, I know. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, and research the animals and then go shop hop for them. That, that's really cool. So how many tanks did you have then as a kid, um, you know, combined in your family? You know, we had the 55-gallon, the, the old classic slate bottom, and then we had a mirror back, flat back hex, and then a 29. Okay. And then what kind of uh, fish did you keep? So you said your dad had a couple goldfish in the beginning, um, but did, you, did your family kind of gravitate towards one type of fish, or was it all over the place? Yeah, you know, it started out with the fancy goldfish. They were always, you know, very intriguing, a lot of personality in the 55-gallon. Uh, and as my siblings grew and I grew up, you know, it really became a family thing. So then it turned into community tanks where we all got to select our own animals and see how they would interact. But we also had to decide, you know, which fish would get along with each other so we, we could have one happy community aquarium. Oh, very cool. And, and were your parents, are they, were they biologists by profession or, or were they just, you know, blue collar, white collar in any industry that's completely outside of aquaria, but they just had a fascination for it? I'd say a fascination. Uh, my dad is actually has a master's in fine arts and taught at Michigan State University, uh, and my mom was a theater major, so <laughs> we always thought outside the box. Oh, very interesting. And so how have your siblings, have they stayed true to the the parents' obsession like, like you have and, and, you know, are staying with the tropical fish hobby? Absolutely. Um, I have one brother in California who has always had a large tank, uh, and then my sister also has a tank still. So it's something that, you know, is near and dear to our hearts even 40 years later. Oh, that is awesome. That's great to hear that, you know, nobody rebelled, or maybe if you rebelled, it was, a, it was a, a small time in your life, but that everybody still has this passion for the hobby, and that nobody was burnt out by the family obsession. <laughs> no, no, it only gets worse as you get older. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Uh, so, uh, so, I guess, tell me about your progression then in the hobby. So, obviously, you're starting very, very young, and I mean, you're doing all this research around the table with your family, which sounds like a super cool activity, and um, actually, I'm, I'm going to try to take that, and hopefully, as my son grows, um, you know, those are, those are aspects that not just, you know, helping me feed the fish and doing the laborious water changes, but, you know, a really fun and engaging research activity. Um, what was your progression through the hobby to the point of, let's say, when you started at uh, Proust Pets in Michigan? Yeah, you know, I never expected this journey to be able to be something I'd turn into a career. It was always a passion, and very few of us actually get to go into that passion and, and make a living at it. Um, Proust Pets was a store that I grew up with in Lansing, Michigan, so it was just kind of that natural thing to uh, one day apply there just after high school um, and got in. And that's kind of something you get into and you never really want to leave, and it just kind of progressed from there, and I grew within the store. 
Yeah, that's really awesome. So I've only ever touched down in Michigan at Detroit Airport on business travel. I've actually never set foot on, on Michigan soil, which is kind of disappointing the number of times I landed at that airport. Um, but talking to yourself, talking to a, a previous guest of the show, Heather Burke, who also worked at Proust Pets, and just hearing her talk about it, it sounds like this is an amazing establishment. Um, and I really hope that sometime soon I get the chance to go out to Michigan, whether it's for work or you know a family vacation. Uh, but I definitely want to make a, kind of a pilgrimage, I guess, out to Proust pets it sounds like you know if you live in michigan or anywhere within a you know reasonable drive distance you should be going to this store and checking it out yeah i would definitely agree uh, i think one thing that made Proust so darn successful was you know the education it was um it was very nurturing to be there and it was very you know his whole kind of point of the sister was to have successful hobbyists but also you know, something that you were passionate about and educated the staff about and really that just connection with everyone who walked through that door just oh. happened to be through the hobby. Yeah, that is, that is fantastic. And so I guess, do you have any memorable stories of your time at Proust Pets or anything that's really stuck, um, stuck out with you or anything funny? <laughs> More than I could write in one big book. <laughs> um, you know, I would say some of the, my favorite things were actually some of the most difficult. Um, we had a full quarantine room and also a breeding facility within that store. Um, so it wasn't just, you know, the fish that were on the floor, but really learning the, the nuances of how to take care of these animals, um, get them through a quarantine process, treat them as needed, um, and then really connecting with a customer on the floor so they can go home, teach their children about it, and really make this, you know, a several-decade thing and not just a short-lived so outside of just the, the amount of education that you're getting in dealing with the quarantine room, becoming a buyer, um, you know, just the, the exposure that comes from working at a retail pet store for so long, as a hobbyist, did your tastes and preferences change before you were at Proust and kind of uh, during your time and then after Proust Pets? Yeah, I, w I would definitely say so. You know, when I hired in there, I thought I knew a whole lot. <laughs> I was kind of humbled that very first day. Um, plants were something I was not very familiar with, and we had a very, very large plant system, and I was handed a book and two large boxes of plants, and Rick said, all right, here you go. <laughs> so to me, that was something they were all green, and I'm going, how the heck do I identify these guys? Um, and that was a great introduction to just another step in the hobby. Um, so after that, cichlids was the next thing that kind of bit me. I asked Rick Proust one day, what is that blue fish? And he said, well, goodness, that's an African cichlid. And that kind of sums up the next 15 years. <laughs> I'm a cichlid nerd. Oh, very cool. And, and so in, to this day, you still are a cichlid nerd? You know, that really is what fueled, I'd say, the next steps in my journey. Um, through there, I actually gained some appreciation for the conventions that are out there, you know, the Keystone Clash, the American Cichlid Association. Um, and Detroit has a large cichlid following. So, you know, for a cichlid nerd, that is a state to be in. And then to go on to national conventions and to vendor shows, it really just was the next step. Oh, very cool. So I guess to kind of jump ahead to the present time, what does your current fish room collection look like? <laughs> well, actually, we moved to Portland recently. Uh, I never thought I would leave Michigan and, you know, never thought that, you know, we just bought a house. I had a whole full basement full of tanks, and this career came up, and it's one of those things that, you know, you just don't turn down an opportunity to work at a place like Seagrass Farms. Um, so as much as my heart and soul still beats for Proust Pets, it was just kind of that next part of the journey and working with Sandy Moore and the whole Seagrass Farms family. It's just been a truly special journey. Yeah, definitely. And how long ago was it that you joined the the uh, Seagrass team? Uh, the Seagrass team, I joined three years ago. Uh, and so asking about those fish tanks to tell you a little bit about uh, the move, we had to sell everything I had, everything in my possession, uh, so we could track down here into a 5 by 9 trailer. So my 180s, my 29s, my 55s, you name it, we had it. <laughs> um, they actually all went back to Proust Pets to other hobbyists, which is kind of neat to see some of those fish still be at the store, as well as some of my fellow hobbyists still own them. Um, and we just currently moved, and we will be setting up a, a nice big fish tank in this new house. Oh, that is awesome. And what do you think you're going to put in that new tank? <laughs> well, that's a silly answer. There will be cichlids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, South American, African, what do you, what do you think? You know, I really, truly enjoy the African cichlids. Uh, when my daughter was born, that's how she learned uh, animals with fish. Uh, and then she learned her colors and then on to, you know, the common names. And now she knows the Latin names of many of the uh, African cichlids. So to really kind of be able to nurture that science within your children is just a fantastic thing. That is that is great. Yeah. And so at what age is your daughter uh, right now? Because, I mean, if she's spouting out Latin names, uh, the scientific names, that's awesome. 
<laughs> I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old. So oh, that is fantastic. Two sharp, very individual. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and, and so I guess now I'll let you just kind of run free and, and, you know, tell us all about Seagrass. Um, what does Seagrass do? Uh, what are the various partnerships out there? Just kind of immerse us in everything that is Seagrass. Yeah, you know, when I, I looked into this, you know, and I ordered fish for several years from Seagrass Farms. Uh, and that relationship was kind of built on it, you know, they were the big guys, you know, is it something I really wanted to work with? And as I got to really know Seagrest and where their heart and soul lies, it was within the hobbyist. You know, that company was built on passion. It was built on a guy with 16 tanks in his basement. Um, so they have a very similar kind of beginning journey as Proust Pets does as well. So I kind of fell in love with that journey. And then you go to visit this place and they have 6,000 tanks of fish in the freshwater building. <laughs> That's a big fish room or multiple large fish rooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one big fish room. Um, so uh, Secret Farms is, uh, produces several of our own animals. Uh, we sell about a million fish a week, and we have about 1,500 different varieties available each week, and we change it by about 30% each week. So I know there's some big stats right there, but basically there's a whole lot of fish, and we're known for the oddballs. So there's always something new and always something exciting we have there. And so what is your, I guess, your market reach like in the United States? Are, are you exclusive to the continental United States? Are you also serving Alaska, Hawaii? And do you do any international business? Yeah, all of the above. Uh, so within our production of our own uh, animals, we have uh, 5,000 bats and 300 ponds, which covers about, goodness, several hundred acres of, of fish farms there <laughs> within Florida. Um, so we supply about 1,000 pet stores within the nation. Uh, and then we do sell globally as well, as long as we can get the animals within their 48 hours. Okay, very cool. So you kind of you self-impose a restriction uh, just to ensure that you know your your customer, and then that that next final customer is going to get a healthy fish. Exactly. We feel what's best for the animals is what we need to do. Um, so if we cannot ensure the animal is going to be at the end destination within 48 hours, um, that's not something we're interested in. But usually we're shooting for 24, and usually the animals are there within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And can you give a breakdown of, you know, rough percentages by, you know, high level family of, um, you know, kind of the, the fish that you breed, or I guess the fish that you do move, I guess I should say? Yeah, sure. Freshwater, I'd say, is definitely the dominating force. We do have substantial saltwater as well. It's probably about 60-40 as far as freshwater versus saltwater. Um, within the freshwater department, 95% of those animals are bred uh, within ponds or vats, so they are captive raised. Uh, and the other 5% are sustainably collected, and we source from places like Project Piava, which you give back to the environment, give back to the ecosystem, um, so that we're not taking more than, you know, our lion's share and making sure that that habitat is there for future generations. Yeah, definitely. And so I guess within the freshwater family, do you, do you tend to move, are we moving more um, bottom-dwelling Corydora type fish? Is it primarily, you know, uh, African cichlids, um, various cichlids? Is it tetras? I guess help, help me kind of understand the freshwater portion. Yeah, sure. Um, goodness, that's a tough call. So I'd say, you know, we have definitely a substantial amount of your bread and butter. So your, your mollies, platies, guppies um, are going to be your, always your top popular critters. Um, by volume and by dollar amount, neon tetras and common fleckos are your number one, too. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So we have, yeah, a complete good amount of those. Um, but what really excites me is that, you know, a solid amount of our stock, we thrive on oddballs. Uh, our purchasing department does a great job of sourcing fish that may only be available once a year. We might only get one or two specimens in, you know, and that's really exciting to go see that, get pictures of it, get it out on social media, and then actually see that the end consumer's tank is just kind of full circle. Yeah, because one of the pictures uh, that you posted up or the Seagrass Farms Instagram account posted up from, I believe it was Super Zoo this past June, was of a, uh, a bristlenose apocostomus with just incredibly, incredibly long bristles on it, right? It was, uh, I mean, I don't want to say it was an albino. I don't think it was an albino, but it was very, or I guess I'll let you take over and tell me what that fish was. <laughs> you know, I have a silly soft spot for these, uh, these bristlenose apocostomus uh, and one of the farms that we work with. They're just a fantastic breeding, these guys. Uh, and that's where a lot of our stock comes from as a local Florida breeder. Um, so I called her up, and she's a third-generation farmer at this, at this place. And I said, hey, you know, do you have something really special for this show? She said, yeah, I'll send you something special. <laughs> um, so it's just a, a nice, big, farm-raised, breeder-sized albino long and personal pleco. Um, but because it's been captive-raised and because it's so used to humans, it was, you know, very personable. Everybody fell in love with them. 
And what I loved about the story of this animal is that it's something that everybody can have. It wasn't exclusive. Oh, very cool. And so what ended up happening to that particular fish? Did somebody at the convention get to take it home? Did it go back to the breeder? Is it in your breed stock? No, this guy, so we had two of them. Um, what we do is a lot of times we'll pre-sell the animals to make sure that they have uh, a journey that end of the show that is going to be safe and sound for them. So one of the local stores bought all the fish in the booths and all the fish along our display tanks, and they have them, I believe, still in the store. You know, that's actually really a cool insight because, you know, you wonder when, you know, you, like Seagrass Farms or whoever it may be goes into it, whether it's a trade show that's only open to retail or it's um, a show open to the public, what actually happens to all of these these fish. Um, and to hear that you guys actually go through the effort to make sure that um, a good portion or all of them are pre-sold and they're going to go to a, a, you know, relatively close by location. Um, that's really cool to know. Like, I, I, I guess I would have just assumed that maybe you, you, you know, package them back up and ship them back home. Yeah, you know, we, we could have done that in the past, but it's just something we feel that's best for the animals that, you know, they've already gone through a decently stressful journey. You know, it's a short show. Let's make sure they get, you know, to the end consumer as soon as possible so they can settle in. Yeah, very cool. And so what about some of the re uh, research partnerships with universities that Seagrass does? We're very, very lucky to have the University of Florida uh, Aquaculture Lab just down the road. Uh, we actually do several interviews with them. Um, and what's really fantastic as they are researching um, fish for the farmers to make sure that the animals that we are expecting them to raise, uh, if they get out into the wild, what would happen? If they're going to be invasive, um, you know, what temperatures can they survive in? On top of all of the conservation efforts, such as they have some of their very first uh, blue eagle hippopotamus from the rising tide right there at the farm. Can you share any insight from the uh, fish for farmers, you know, understanding of maybe what they've discovered or uh, anything that's come of that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I'd say that a lot of times, you know, when you decide to put a fish in production, it's a several-year process. You know, by the time you, you're going to take those ponds and set them up with brood stock that you know is going to be quality stock and actually get those animals up to size and, and then breeding quantities, it's probably about a two-year process. So it's something we have to plan pretty far out. Uh, and so the lab has been essential in being able to tell us, you know, if this animal is worth raising in Florida, is it something we should source from the wild to sustainably collect it? Or is it something that we can get actually overseas that's going to be a healthier animal, you know, a better journey? So lots of different things that come from that, that study that really help the farmers out and really actually kind of keep them in business. Has there been any particular species where they were like, you know what, you, you guys may be able to breed it, but this may be something better that we um, source from an overseas provider as opposed to breeding it uh, domestically in Florida? Yeah, I, I say a lot of the libraries, um, you know, the uh, mollies tend to be a really, really great source from overseas, where the swordtails, because of the water we have and because of um, the specific uh, chemistry in one of the ponds, uh, our red brick swordtails and our red velvet swordtails tend to be some of the absolute reddest swordtails in the industry. So it's fascinating to really see kind of how it breaks down and uh, which species, even from farm to farm, is going to do better. Oh, interesting. And, and so I guess kind of understanding what fish, you know, you should be working with or you shouldn't be working with. Um, I, I guess when I ask most people what they think of the of the aquarium hobby, uh, the directions, the shifts and trends, um, you know, within the United States and kind of globally, the, the general consensus is that, you know, we are going towards smaller tanks. We're going towards the nano tanks, smaller fish, um, you know, more more neon tetras, more rummy nose tetras. Um, you know, the, the celestial pearl Daniel, beca Daniel becoming in incredibly popular um, in planted tanks. And so I guess my question would be, um, what do Seagrass Farms do? Or I guess how easily can Seagrass Farms kind of transition in, with, in the fish that they're working with um, to kind of meet this uh, change in the market? Yeah, I think it's a really great question. You know, a lot of what we say, okay, you know, as far as pond volume animal, animals <laughs> are going to be those, you know, you know 10,000 mollies or 5,000 sighties a week kind of numbers. So when we're sourcing out those really fantastic nano fish, we want them to be, you know, very high quality, kind of babied. Uh, so we're also going to source those guys from outside places. Uh, the Czech Republic is one of our, our top places to dig into those animals because they're very, very meticulous about how they breed those fish, how they ship those fish. Um, and in a pond setting in Florida, it's an animal that just doesn't do well as far as being a nano critter. They're often predated on or they don't do well in the heat or they're just more challenging to raise than something like a molly. Oh, that's very fascinating. And then as far as... Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess as, sorry, sorry. <laughs> as far as um, other conservation efforts, so you've mentioned uh, Project Piaba, you mentioned Rising Tides. Uh, do you want to go a little bit deeper into either one of those? Um, I know Rising Tides is definitely going to be more, obviously, for the saltwater side of things, but, um, you know, if there's a lot of 
uh, value and importance around that. I mean, feel free to kind of let the listeners know a little bit more about that, even though that, like I said, we're a freshwater show, but we can appreciate any conservation effort if it's going to be for, uh, <laughs> for a living creature. Absolutely. You know, really, truly, really it's all connected. Um, you know, Project Biaba is something that is, is a wonderful, wonderful concept, and it really has kind of finally come to fruition. Um, and there's so much that surrounds it. You know, you're not just dealing with fish, but you're dealing with culture and ecotourism. And um, this is a project that covers 52,000 acres. So it's not small. (laughs) Um, And the whole concept is that, you know, wild caught is bad. Wild caught, you know, when when you say that to people, you know, no one wants to take animals from the wild from the habitats because it feels wrong. Um, The flip side to that is if we don't take these animals from the wild sustainably, those people that have been fishing for five generations now have no jobs. You know, there's no McDonald's early on the Amazon. You can't just go feed your family at Walmart. (laughs) Right, yep. Um, So they often turn to other avenues such as logging or farming, which is cutting down a lot of the rainforest. Yeah, and and I think that's something that, you know, initially we have this gut reaction of, you know, like to your point, oh, you know, taking from the wild, that's bad. We shouldn't do that. We should leave the habitat alone. Um, But understanding that if that source of income goes away, if that sense, if that source of uh, food security, uh, uh, of income security for your family, you know, um, fathers and mothers are going to do what they need to do to put food on the table for their children. So like you said, that's going to be things like um, farming. It's going to be things like, um, you know, cattle and, and gold mining and just all of these other incredibly destructive practices. And so, you know, working with Project Piaba to find that balance is really, really admirable. Um, and how about rising tides? Rising tide has been fantastic. Um, you know, that started out as something small and really kind of you know, just an idea on how can we actually kind of raise these marine fish in captivity uh, and have a fully, not just mariculture, where you take the fry in from the ocean, you pen them in, you raise them in the ocean, and get them up to size. Um, a truly aquacultured species is going to be something that where its parents have been raised in captivity, and you raise the fry from egg to full stage. And so, so I, the I, first success, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that, you know, being being a, a very much a freshwater guy, I've never dabbled in, in saltwater other than maybe, you know, enjoying sushi or going snorkeling in Hawaii. Um, <laughs> so so you're saying that uh, is, is breeding fish, uh, breeding saltwater fish in captav- captivity more of a challenge than it is freshwater? Substantially. Um, so the, the zebra zone is, you know, the yellow tang uh, took Chris 11 years to crack the code on how to raise the animal. Um, so without the funding at the Hawaii Institute with places from the rising tide and other people in the industry kind of coming forward and saying, you know, this is very, very important. We figured this out. What do you need to be successful? How can we help you? And the rising tide was a huge, um, for to air, a huge portion of that. I mean, without giving away the, the secret in the, uh, in the pudding, I mean, what, what kind of is, is an overarching theme of, of what, you know, that, that team was able to crack of why it was so difficult to raise some of, or to try to even breed some of these uh, saltwater fish in captivity? You know, that was really great because when we got to visit the lab, uh, when they gave us a call and said, do you want to come see the dories? Of course, they called them hippo tanks. I'm going to call them dories. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> uh, we're, we're 10 minutes down the road. So you know, our staff was over the moon uh, because it's been so secretive. We knew it was coming down the pipe that now that the yellows have been bred, the blues were coming next. Um, so once we got there, you know, just to be able to stand over that bin and look at an animal that has never seen, you know, anything else, you know, this is the very first batch of blue regal hippo tanks. And then he took us through the entire process of, you know, you could raise them up to 10 days and then they'd lose them. They'd raise them up to 30 days and then lose them. Um, and the largest challenge was food. You know, they figured out at a certain stage that even though the animal had eyes, the food that they were feeding them, the animal truly couldn't see because that part of the eye wasn't developed. Oh, wow. So not something we knew until we started studying these animals. Oh, that's incredible. And, and so how long was this, was this process just to breed the yellow tang? Like how much research and in the number of years that they put into this? The yellow tang was 11 years. Wow. That is, <laughs> that is incredible dedication. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, and, and so I guess, uh, what does, uh, what, do, what does the future look like for Seagrass Farms? And in more particular, is Seagrass going to have a presence at um, Aquatic Experience coming up in New Jersey this year? Absolutely. That is one of our top favorite shows. You know, we have several favorite shows, but the aquatic experience is really that place to give back and that place to really kind of, you know, get back to the nitty gritty, back to the heartbeat of the hobby, right? That's the hobbyist. Um, uh, so I will be speaking there, but we'll also have a booth there and uh, we continue to grow. And now that we're with Central Garden and Pet, that really has just given us the chance to work with the dry goods team uh, to see how we can actually kind of start 
synergizing with their projects and with their new tanks, new filters, what kind of fish can we actually buddy up with that? So as a consumer, they can pick out a tank and say these fish are the ones that go with the tank. So it's kind of a win-win situation. Oh, that's excellent. Very cool. And anything Definitely. El- any, anything else on the horizon for yourself or for Seagrass Farms that uh, you're privy to be able to share with us? Yeah, I mean, that's really, I'd say, our, our largest growth. Uh, and, you know, I, we're very, very active on lots of legislative boards. Uh, I'm sure as you have heard, you know, the whitelist that is in Michigan is going to be coming up again this year. Um, and oftentimes when a light whitelist is passed in one area, legislation looks at that and they're also going to pass it in Maine, you know, Connecticut. And then it kind of spreads throughout the U.S. Um, and that would be very challenging. And the other thing is the right to own your pet. There's a lot of, you know, groups out there that are either misinformed or really trying to make sure that the animals have the right homes or the animals are not in captivity entirely altogether. Um, and it's our job to be able to provide the right information for the people that are doing it correctly so that as consumers, we can still own pets and everything is good across the board. Yeah, and it's actually on the agenda for the show that uh, to have uh, Mr. Sam Rutka out of uh, Easy Aquariums in Maine, to have him back on to talk about the work that he's doing on Maine's whitelist and, and PJAC. Um, but, you know, short of, of diving into that episode when that happens in the future, what are things now that people listening to this that are, are concerned and don't want to whitelist in their area and want to be able to help another state, you know, kind of educate and combat this? Um, what are some resources that, that I might be able to link in the show that people can check out? Uh, maybe it's a, a petition or, you know, contact a congressman or what do you think people can do, the, the average hobbyist, to start making a buzz and let people know that, hey, you know, we, we actually do care about it and this is the wrong direction? Yeah, definitely. Captain Duckweed is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Captain Duckweed. <laughs> uh, I actually grew up with Jason from Easy Aquariums. He started out at Proof Pets and Sam is one of his employees and is fantastic for the voice of the industry. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> this hobby is a small, uh, it's a small world in the uh, tropical fish hobby I'm learning. <laughs> it really is, you know, and then from the Florida fish farmers, you know, all the way up to the people within, you know, nationals, you know, when we go to these conventions, these shows, it's kind of a big family reunion. We're just, it's a big group home for nerds is what we call it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, but as far as legislation goes, I'd say pjack.org um, is going to be a really fantastic place. They put out alerts um, and what they do on those alerts is put links into either click here to call your senator or click here for more information. So they're very, very good about directing the hobby to here's some resources for you. Here's the issue. Here's how to act. Um, uh, OFI, Ornamental Fish International, uh, they're more, they're European. We also have a U.S. version of them, uh, but they are fantastic as well. Um, and they deal a lot with the CITES. They just had their, their big meeting over in France about the CITES listing as of animals and and how we can stay active in that and make sure that all the laws are in place to make sure that the animals that need to be protected are, and then animals that need to have listings are listed, and then animals that may come up for review as far as are they available. Oh, that's excellent information. And, and Shelby, I guess I'll leave it with, um, you know, give us some, some websites or some social media where if people are interested in learning more about Seagrass Farms, where can they go to find out more? Definitely. So Facebook and Instagram, you know, we're seagrassfarms.com. Uh, I do a lot of the posts on there, so certainly we're really interested on that. And people message me all day long about, you know, how to help them with their animal or what's going to be the right fish for their tank. We love seeing people's pictures about their fish or the stories about their fish because that's really what it's all about. Um, and then we have our website at seagrassfarms.com. So you can visit that and check out what we've got. We have an archive list of, goodness, 22,000 fish we've carried in the past to give you kind of an idea of what's there. Wow, that is that is a large number. <laughs> they said we, we like to collect them all. That's our that's our goal. Yeah, there it's uh, it, it's Pokemon, <laughs> but for the uh, the tropical fish hobby, very cool. Well, Shelby, exactly. Thank you very much for uh, staying up late again. You're on East Coast time. I'm on West Coast time. I really appreciate it. I, I hope the listeners, uh, you know, appreciate learning more about yourself and Seagrass Farms and. Um, you know, some, some very important uh, topics like conservation, uh, rising tides, Project Piaba, but also, you know, the, the legislation, the potential for whitelists, um, and just what they can do to, to be a more informed and involved hobbyist to, to ensure that we can preserve our hobby um, so that our children's and, and our children's children can inherit it and enjoy the fish like we do right now. Absolutely. I'd say, if, you know, get out to Aquatic Experience. That's a great show. You know, if you don't have a tank or you have 100 tanks in your basement, it's a show for everybody. You know, I am I am booked up for aquatic experience. I will be going. I've got flights and uh, hotel accommodations, so I will be there. Shelby, uh, I'll stop by the booth. I'll introduce myself in person, shake your hand, and thank you. Um, and thank you again for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it.
Yeah, I appreciate you having me on here. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. So this is going to be the uh, the first time in Aquarius podcast history where we are going to have um, the same guest back on a few days later to have kind of a part two conversation. Um, so Shelby Bush, welcome back to the Aquarius podcast. And there's a couple really cool things that uh, we didn't get a chance to go in too much um, in depth about. One of those being oddball fish that Seagrass Farms uh, currently has. And the second one is a con- is another conservation effort that Seagrass has launched. So um, if you want to start with the conservation effort, Shelby, um, again, welcome back to the show. And uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Well, fantastic. It's always great to come back and talk fish. You're always welcome. <laughs> awesome. Well, again, we'll definitely start off with the conservation thing because that's always, you know, first and foremost. And when we, we think of fish in our habitat. Um, so when we got to thinking, what can we do to give back? What can we do to kind of connect the, the wholesaler with the hobbyist? Because that's always just, I think, a challenge. Um, so we came up with this program where it's a coral conservation awareness program. Uh, so it's an initiative we have launched with public aquariums and zoos where we are donating coral frags to these people um, that they're going to put on their, their vaccines tours and then grow them up and put them on display in hopes that people kind of gain a greater knowledge to um, where their corals came from, uh, what's sustainably wild collected versus mariculture versus aquacultured and how simply by being a hobbyist and actually keeping these corals in your aquarium, you're actually a part of the conservation efforts. Oh, that is awesome. And so where are we now or where is Seagrass rather in this, uh, in this conservation effort? Yeah. So we launched it with Newport Aquarium uh, and that was an absolutely fantastic launch with Dan Hagley. Uh, really just a very warm welcome. Uh, and they immediately put them on display on their tour, uh, and I believe at the end of this year, the frags will actually go on display on their main uh, exhibits. So they've been doing follow-ups with us, they've been doing follow-up videos, and it's gotten just a fantastic response. Uh, and we now have an actual donation page on our website where you can go, we vetted these people to say, okay, these are legit people like uh, Coral Restoration. Um, you know, those guys are great people to donate to, you know. So basically just an awareness program to really kind of bring it all full picture. Oh, that's fantastic. And so uh, I, I guess in the ideal state, um, you know, how many public aquariums does Seagrass want to have participating in this program? Um, what might be the next one on the horizon? We actually just got back from Riverbanks uh, Zoo over in South Carolina. Um, so we did a little teaser video on our Facebook last week, and you should see the full video where we've got interviews with the staff um, talking about the efforts, um, and just the whole partnership between you know, animals and people on conservation, and it's not just for hobbyists, it's for zoos and aquariums, and we're all in this together. So you'll see that coming up soon, and then we have four other facilities uh, on the horizon. Oh, that's very cool. So the video is not ready yet, so it's not something that I can link in the show notes um, because this episode will actually come out uh, fairly soon in the next couple days. But um, you'll, I, I would assume then via your social media and on the Seagrass website, you'll have links to that and, and make that publicly available? Absolutely. Oh, very cool. And if you happen to be in the, uh, you know, in the Carolinas area or somewhere in the southeast uh, and you get a chance to go check it, check that out at that aquarium, um, I would say, you know, go for it. That sounds like a really cool thing to see. Yeah, absolutely. We made some, you know, really great posters, you know, as you're taking a tour and the staff is very well informed. So if you or your kids are out there, definitely go see it. Awesome. All right. So let's move into the oddball. So again, I'm going to apologize because, you know, you made it a point as I was going back through our interview listening to it, which is a part of my, you know, post-production process that you talked about Seagrass specializing on oddballs. And I really let you down as the as the interviewer to not ask you to dive a little deeper into that. Um, thankfully, you know, you, you wanted to come back on to talk about the coral program. So now you've got an opportunity to, to really highlight some of those oddball species that you currently have. So we've got uh, one through six. I think we're going to go through all of them and just let you kind of, you know, run with it again and let us know each one and, you know, I'll interrupt and ask some questions because I'm sure I'm going to have a lot uh, because oddballs, I'm not the most specialized person when it comes to the oddballs, but I'm very excited to hear about them, Shelby. Yeah, fantastic. I appreciate it. You know, this is something that I was excited about and, you know, we talked about a ton of great things about Seagrass and this is one of our, our true highlights is, you know, we're just a big bunch of fish geeks over there, so... We're constantly looking for new, latest and greatest things you can get out there and share with you. So it was hard to narrow it down to six, you know, out of the 1,500 varieties that got there. But I think these are six of my highlighted careers for this week. All right. So what's number one? All right. You know what? Number one is the Royal Clown Loach. Um, and this critter is something I saw, you know, on the Internet when it first surfaced in the 1990s, obviously not on the Internet. Uh, but as I started getting more into the hobby into these oddballs, and I was like, man. 
that's a fish you don't see. No one's ever going to get that animal. I've never seen it available. Um, and I say in the last couple of years, we've started to see these guys, you know, come down a little bit in price uh, and be a little bit more sustainably collected and now become available. Okay, and so the background, I mean, wh- uh, where does this fish come from? This guy is from China. So it's, it's more in the upper, you know, kind of Yangtze Basin area of China. So it's going to be a little bit heavier flow. Uh, and when you look at this animal, this guy gets big. You know, he maxes out at a good 30 inches long term. So much like your other clown loaches, they get big. Um, but they're much more elongated. They almost have a neat tiger pattern to them and a beautiful red striped tail on them. Uh, and you can tell this animal is built for, you know, to hang out in the current. So very unique, very different. Same, I'd say, behavior as your clown loaches and going to need a good size tank. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. So you would recommend, um, you know, I, I believe with, with clown loaches, everybody kind of throws out the standard of a minimum of six clown loaches. Do you think that same rule applies to these royal uh, clown loaches? Yeah, they tend to be, I would say, a little less shy once they do get settled in. Uh, and when we see them collected, they're going to be already eight to ten inches. Uh, the, the big boys we have in stock right now are actually about a good solid foot. So they're not little. <laughs> you do want to start with like a 125 or a 150 uh, to really make these guys thrive and definitely make sure that you've got your water chemistry in check because they're, they're on the sensitive side. And then as far as diet goes, um, I'm assuming the, the standard snails, um, inverts kind of kind of diet for them? Yeah, they are scarfing down black rooms like no tomorrow. Uh, you know, they would probably easily take a frozen food um, and really a kind of prepared pellet once they do get settled in the aquarium and you don't have any aggressive feeders on top of them. Do you have any idea of what part of the country these guys will be going to? Really, it depends on, uh, you know, who picks these guys up. You know, it's fair game to the whole nation, so <laughs> hopefully a store near you. Gotcha, gotcha. Very cool. All right, so Royal Clown Loach was number one. Let's move on to number two. All right. Now, the hot little catfish, you know, he actually has been in the, the hobby for, goodness, many, many years. Close these cats are very popular. Um, but these albino catfish coming out of the Czech Republic are just absolutely awesome. <laughs> Um, the hapla cats are known for being much more, you know, in, you know I would say inquisitive, curious. You know, you can actually teach them to eat out of your hands. So unlike some of the other catfish, you know, they just tend to be much more interactive. Wow, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm having to look these guys up on Google. Well, I had to do this with the Royal Clown Loach, and I'm probably going to do it with all six of them. <laughs> I'm on Google Images right <laughs> no, now. Right. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I can't say that I've ever come across either um, in any of the forums that I've ever been a part of um, or just any message boards, any Facebook groups where I've seen this particular catfish. Um, definitely really cool looking. So I'm assuming coming out of the Czech Republic, because the, that's where the, the breeding is being done, uh, where are these guys coming from out of the wild? So in the wild, you're going to find these in the northern Brazil area, uh, kind of towards the East Andes, you know, Amazon Basin, that kind of general, you know, most of your catfish are going to be from there. Uh, but that's where the hoplo catfish kind of resides. Um, and what is just awesome about this critter, many, many things, uh, is our bubble nesters. Um, so the male is actually going to build a big bubble nest up there. Uh, the female will come lay her eggs, and he's going to boot her out because she's either going to eat them or usually destroy the nest. So very, very unique um, on top of being inquisitive and this particular albino being almost like a sherbet colored with some neat gray pattern uh, also has some great behaviors. Yeah, wow, very cool. A bubble nesting catfish. I, you know, I never yeah. would have never guessed that, you know, uh, breeding strategy for a, for a catfish. That probably would have been the last, um, you know, of the known kind of tropical fish behaviors for breeding. I, I think that would have been the last one I would have guessed for, especially for a catfish. Um, and as far as, um, you know, size, uh, tank size requirements, um, uh, I guess tank mates, kind of give us that rundown. Yeah, you know, of the quick these this guy stays a little bit smaller. So three to five inches are going to be max on them. Um, and what I love about it is it's a community fish, you know, much like a quarry cat, kind of treat them like a big brocus. You know, that's kind of their behavior as far as scavenging on the bottom. Certainly he's going to scarf up any available eggs that, you know, other fish lay, things like that. But for the most part, he's happy to just kind of scavenge around, hang in his little hidey hole, um, and not really bother anything. So 30 gallon, I'd say, is where I would put a minimum at. Um, when they're younger, certainly you could start like a 15 long, but I would go for the 29 on those. Oh, that's awesome. Very cool. So awesome fish for number two. So far, I mean, number one and two are, are they're both awesome fish. <laughs> I have a feeling that all six of these are going to be know. awesome fish. So, <laughs> it was so hard to pick. <laughs> I can imagine. That must have been really tough for you to go through your facility and try to pick <laughs> six fish for us to talk about in kind of part due of, uh, you know, this, this interview. So uh, what, what's, what's number three, Shelby? All right. Not to be outdone by a bubble nester, I had to bring a bed on on here. <laughs> 
And again, I mean, this is something that, you know, I've, I've never come across before. I'm looking at the uh, Google image pictures right now, and this is a really beautiful fish. So tell us a little bit more about the beta macrostoma. That is a beautiful animal. Um, you know, of course, I've gotten bitten by the cichlid bug, but obviously bettas were definitely one of my favorites. And there's great betta conventions out there to feed your terrible, terrible addiction to this hobby. It's, it's a great addiction. It's not terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my first encounter with a wild betta was actually a betta macrostoma. Um, one, the color is just beyond anything I can really describe. I'm sure you're seeing on Google, they're intense orange with these big bluish black stripes on their face and these black trim fins. So very different from your classic that you're used to seeing. Yeah, these things are definitely beautiful. Their tail reminds me of like the uh, I, uh, the the Spanish flamenca. I'm probably going to butcher that that last name, but almost like the, <laughs> the gals, you know, in their beautiful dresses and their fans that they have in their hand. That's almost what the tail reminds me of, that patterning. Yeah, they're they're truly a, a dynamic animal. Uh, and another great thing about them is, unlike some of their other, you know, their bellas and some of the splendid counterparts, is that these guys can actually live together in a larger aquarium. So you can have a pair or two, uh, sometimes a harem, um, kind of idea, knowing that you may need to remove some leaves as the bales kind of select their pair. Um, as long as you give them enough space, enough hiding places, you can actually house these guys together. Okay, so is this going to be one of the fish where you want to do... Um, and I think maybe you've already kind of answered this, um, where you do two males per one female in a trio, or is it the two females to one male trio? I, you know, I would honestly, I would put a harem in there to, to let him select his female okay. and then pull the rest of the ladies out. So you could actually have pair to pair. Uh, but once he's selected his female, he's, he's going to breed with her. He's actually a mouth brooder, which makes him fantastic as well. Um, where he's going to incubate the eggs in his mouth for up to a good month. So very different behavior than your splendens. Awesome. Very cool. And these guys, are you getting them, are they wild caught or are they captive, uh, captive bred? These guys are wild caught. And the ones we are receiving, uh, they're from Borneo, and they're good solid three inches already. So the, the males and females we have in stock are full size, ready for breeding. Um, goodness, they're, they're just <laughs> very dynamic. Cool. And as far as pH goes, so since they're wild caught, I mean, these aren't like the super acidic, um, you know, have to throw a, a ton of tannins in your water. These can, can go in, in pretty much close to tap water. I, I would have been, I'd be careful on that. Uh, we do have them in our reverse osmosis system we have at Seagrest. Oh, uh, gotcha. A lot of our okay. water is, as we call, liquid chalk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, but we. So I, I guess what would be your pH that you would recommend then? Because I know here in Washington, we have fairly soft water already out of the tap where, you know, in, in other parts of the country and your more cichlid, you know, cichlid land, if you will, in the Midwest, um, it's definitely a lot harder. So what, what would you say your pH you'd want to shoot for for these guys? Yeah, I would shoot for a pH. My biggest thing is making sure it's stable. So if you've got a pH between, you know, 6.4 to 7.72, 7, um, I wouldn't run them a whole lot higher than that. You may just see some, you know, not get the breeding behaviors you want out of them. And they also adapt a little bit better down to like 70 degrees rather than the warmer temperatures of um, some of the other tropical bettas. Okay, that's good. So they, they don't need straight acid then, right? No, no. I would still, you know, tannins are great. That's where you're going to really get that color pulled out of those guys. So, you know, tannins are definite. You know, almond leaves, all those things. Um, I would say treat them like your classic wild betta to get the best out of these fish. Yeah, and this definitely just reminds me that I need to have an actual episode dedicated to the wild betta, um, going through the, the various different species and, uh, you know, going deeper into a, into a species like the betta macrostoma. So i uh, got to put a pin in that to make sure I get somebody on here to talk about that. All right, so what's number yeah, four? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> All right. All right, so this one I was just beyond excited about. Uh, I was actually at Super Zoo when we received these fish. We were going to take them to Super Zoo, but they didn't arrive in time. Uh, and this is the sterlet sturgeon. Uh, so this is the smaller version, smaller being three feet <laughs> instead of 10 to 13 feet, uh, and comes out of the, the Black Sea in the rivers near Siberia. So who, who wants to keep a sturgeon, I guess? That's my question. So I have, <laughs> I have fished for sturgeon. A couple summers ago, I went out and I fished for, you know, the, the, I think it was the white sturgeon um, in the Columbia River. And, I mean, this thing is a dinosaur, right? It took us probably an hour to pull it out of the water. And it was, I mean, God, like seven eight feet long is just an absolute behemoth so granted this is smaller but who I, I guess who out there who in your experience is like you know what i need in my life <laughs> i don't need a beta macrostoma i don't need a clown loach i need a sturgeon i need a sturgeon you know i'd say i'm gonna give a big old kudos to the monster fish keepers out there because you know 
that's part of the clan. <laughs> uh, but the other people that come to mind that is a perfect person for this animal, uh, it could be people with ponds. Uh, and I would say ponds that do get cool. So, you know, Florida is going to be a little bit toasty for them. They don't like it that warm. Uh, but for your northern ponds, this animal is perfect. My God, that's like something that you would have like the, the you know, neighborhood annoying kid. You'd, lead, you know, lure him to your pond and have your sturgeon attack him or something. <laughs> I just, I, okay. Any, yeah. any, anybody out there, like I know we have decent coverage across. Actually, I think we've got um, listeners in all 50 states. So if you know anybody or you are this person that's like, you know what, I need a sturgeon in my life. I've got a pond or I already have a sturgeon in my life. Message me. I'd love to talk to you. <laughs> Maybe we'll just do an episode about you talking about your sturgeon and, you know, the the bully kids that you feed him or, you know, the, the mailman that threw your mail in the garbage. I don't know. Whatever. I just want to I just want to know <laughs> what's going on with the sturgeon that's that, that's in your life. <laughs> well, and they're they're actually very inquisitive, a lot like the hoplo cats. Um, obviously, you know, they're decently endangered in the wild, if not highly endangered, depending on the species and the area they're from. Uh, so these have been completely captive raised from beginning to end, um, and they would come right up as I was doing the live a couple of weeks ago, and they were sucking on my fingers and, you know, crawling up my arms trying to <laughs> eat the air bubbles off. So, yeah, I could see a, a three-foot critter being in your pond being very intimidating, but these guys are honestly very gentle. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool that they're that <laughs> friendly. And what, where are they coming from the, since they're captive bred? The captive bred, you know, I honestly don't know that. It'd be something I'd have to ask um, our purchasing department, uh, as they source all sorts of crazy things like this. Um, <laughs> so not out of the check, because the check tends to be really good at some of the smaller critters, but a different vendor that's going to do some of the, the captive raising of these guys. Gotcha. So has Secrets Farms, then, and I'm going to digress a little bit, has Secrets Farms sure. ever had, you know, Randy's backyard fish pond breeder, you know, call up a buyer and say, hey, I've got let's say sturgeons, you know, like, do you want to have, do you want 20 of my sturgeons that I just bred? Is it, I mean, it, does that ever go down? Yeah, we actually, we have a vetting process. Um, so we have a pin request that's on our website. Uh, you can go as, into the about us section and pull up the vendor request. Uh, and what that's going to do is it kind of fields out people that are, you know, fantastic basement readers. That's great. Uh, but just not into quite niche market for us, uh, versus some of the vendors that might be not legit or not collecting, you know, sustainably. Um, so, yeah, you can go right on there and see the questions we ask, and you can submit a vendor pin request, uh, and that goes over to our purchasing department to vet, and then we have a whole process of being able to contact you. And, yeah, we have breeders from, you know, small-time breeders up to the guys that do 52 box orders, you know, from Indonesia. Wow, that's super cool. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Shelby. That's, that's really cool for, uh, to know. Okay, so yeah. we're down to number five. Down to number five. Man. <laughs> All right. So I want to bring this guy up because he's the freshwater frogfish uh, as it's listed. But honestly, it can be freshwater, but really and truly it should be up to brackish, um, a high level of brackish. But this guy is so fascinating. He had to come on the show. And what's great is he's not full marine. So you can still own this animal without having all the you know concerns of a full marine tank. All right. And so I guess, the, you know, before we dive into this guy, um, how much of your fish at Seagrass are brackish fish? Brackish, you know, we don't. We have a small percentage of brackish, but what we try and get is very oddball. So, you know, so obviously, like this guy, uh, we had the lionfish. That's a brackish animal. Your classics, like your night goby, um, you know, those kind of critters, um, tiger dats, monos, ruby monos. So it's a very, very finite niche market, but we do have, I'd say, a decent selection for brackish animals. And so walk me through, I guess, a little bit more about the profile of the freshwater frogfish. I'm looking at a picture of him right now. He looks like the, he's, he's going to eat anything that goes by his face. <laughs> so I'm not entirely sure he's like a brackish community fish, but help educate me on this guy. He be community, but he's a glutton. So your community would quickly uh, dwindle. <laughs> um, so, you know, just like your, your marine frogfish, he's definitely going to be an ambush predator and be darn good at it. Uh, and could eat something you know, over half the size of the body, if not larger, he will certainly try. So, oh, wow. so I would really say this guy is, <laughs> is, is he, is he he's, so he's going to be a solo tank inhabitant then? Yeah, yeah, on the safe side. You okay. may get away with, you know, doing some big silver dollars um, while he's, you know, in the brackish, or I'm sorry, in the fresh stage. Um, but honestly, keep him by himself. That's going to be the safest thing for him and his companions. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely neat looking. And then as far as that tank size, so he's by himself, uh, what size tank can he go in or should go in, I should say? Yeah, 
keeps you going. <laughs> There's not a ton of information on this guy as far as long term, um, but from what we understand, as a 29 gallon gun would be where I would stick this guy long term for this uh, when maybe considering something bigger. But uh, he doesn't get much larger than around six to eight inches, is from what I know of. Okay, very cool. And then as far as feeding him, so would we feed him like feeder fish? What are, what are we giving this guy? Yeah, if you're going to do live food, I would just make sure that you either quarantine your live animals or you're going to feed him because you always want to be careful of pathogens you're trading on and off. Um, and give him a good solid animal that you're going to feed. So if you're going to raise your own lollies or raise your own guppies that you can gut load them, that's going to be better than kind of your straight up goldfish. Um, you know, but he's, he's going to pretty much try and eat anything. So earthworms, uh, eventually I think frozen food he will readily take once he's settled in as well. Okay, very cool to know. All right, and so let's move on to number six, the final oddball fish of the evening to conclude uh, round due of Shelby Bush on the Aquarius <laughs> podcast. So what is it? Well, you know we couldn't escape without a cichlid on here. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> uh, so aside from my favorite Malawan cichlids, they will always have my heart. You know, I had to stick with the cichlids, but this guy is from the North East, sorry, northeastern Africa, which is just a strange area for any fish, let alone a cichlid to be in. Uh, and that is the Danachilia shukaray. The Danachilia shukaray. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, dive into into this particular cichlid. <laughs> You know, I ran across this guy, uh, you know, I saw him on Google, and I was like, oh, goodness, what is this? And then they came in stock, and I was like, oh, my gosh, there it is. This animal looks like the mix between, you know, something from South America in the Thoracthes group crossed with something on a Malawian hapochromus group, and then you've got a geophagus stinectronide head to it. It's just a cool-looking animal. Uh, and it's from the Danakil Depression over in Ethiopia. So these lakes are hot. They're They're highly saline. They're up around 85 degrees, 90 degrees, so just very, very unique and very, I'd say, just oddball. And are those the lakes that are incredibly, they have a very, very high pH? Yes. Okay. Yes, extremely alkaline. You want to run above nine with these guys. Yeah, so I mean, and there's not many fish, right, that fall into that category. Like, these are one of the few fish that actually, you know, that, that are in the hobby, um, albeit not super well dispersed, but that are in the hobby that are at that, like, pH range, correct? Definitely, yeah. And yeah. certainly some of the Lake Tanganyika critters can get right up there. You know, they're happy at 9, 9, 2. Um, but this one I'd say is definitely, you don't want to drop them much below 8, 8, you know, 8, 6. Um, there's definitely been some hobbyists very successful with them. Uh, the ones we receive are captive raised and every bit the behavior of your classic happy-go-lucky cichlid to come eat out of your hands. Yeah, very cool. And then as far as um, stocking that tank, like what, what, what size would you recommend? Um, you know, how, how large of a group would you say um, to, to have this guy? Yeah, from what I've seen about people keeping these guys long-term is doing a large group. Uh, I would say, you know, 75 gallons on up long-term because they do get around 8 inches. So it's going to be a big fish. But big fish, a couple males, you know, several females, that way they can kind of pair off uh, is going to be best for them. Yeah, and typically with a fish like this too, species only, right? Yeah, I'd say, you know, as they kind of understand more about this animal, as more hobbies begin to keep them, then they can kind of start playing around with compatibility, things like that. But because of their, you know, just truly unique behavior and truly unique uh, parameters they require. Um, there's only two described species that have been found, uh, as I say, two out of the five that have been completely described. So it'd be tough tough to say what to mix with them at this point. Very cool. So, yeah, somebody uh, can have the opportunity if, you know, if you're a big cichlid nut or you want to dabble in cichlids on the really rare and unique side of things, the Danica Shukare is definitely a, a cichlid that's up there. I mean, I know I've heard it talked about um, as being a really, really neat fish. So very cool. All right, Shelby. So that was the uh, the top six oddball fish. And we got a chance to also talk about the coral conservation effort that Seagrass has kicked off. And definitely looking forward to uh, that video that's going to come out to talk more about that. Um, and also just see that uh, program really you know, spread its wings and uh, take off across the country. And hopefully you guys are getting into a ton more of uh, the public aquariums out there. Definitely. We'll keep you posted. All right, Shelby. Well, thank you so much again for joining me. This is going to be the second sign-off for the evening for the Aquarius podcast episode. Uh, thank you very much for uh, <laughs> for coming on again, Shelby. And, you know, hey, let's let's have you on again soon, all right? All right. Anytime. Thank you again for listening to the Aquarius podcast. As always, Get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds.